Today I've travelled to Lytham St Anne's and I've been attending the Probe UK Paranormal and UFO Conference and I'm delighted to speak with Charles Hall who is a Vietnam vet. He has a Masters in Nuclear Physics and he has had some phenomenal experiences in Nevada, Charles, is that right? That's correct, yes. Now, um, I would just ask viewers to keep an open mind when listening to Charles. Um, he's a very eloquent man, as we found out yesterday when we um, listened to his talk. Now, if you just start with your, because um, you were a we weather observer, um, could you tell us what that's about and, and why, do, why do we need weather observers? What <laughs> well, thank you for having me on your show. I enlisted in the U.S. Air Force in July 1964, and making a very long story short, I became a weather observer. I was trained to be a weather observer. In the 60s, before the Internet and computers, you had to have a person actually go out and measure the winds and look at the clouds and send in wind reports. My job, uh, um, and plot up weather maps and so on. I was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada, uh, outside Las Vegas, Nevada, and for from 1965 till 1960 till May of 1967. And of that time, I spent most of it at the Indian Springs Gunnery Ranges, northwest of Nellis. They're like 90 miles. It, it's a Nevada is a big de stretch of desert and. It was out in the Indian Springs Valley, which is a desert valley covered with mountains. I discovered that, uh, as the weather observer, it was my duty to get up at 3 in the morning and go out to drive up in, out into the desert and release a weather balloon and track it and phone the winds into Nellis. I discovered that at the north end of Indian Springs Valley, there is a base that the U.S. Air Force has for extraterrestrials. I named those extraterrestrials the Tall Whites. I described those that... Uh, I described that two-year stretch that I was out there in my four-book series, which I've entitled Millennial Hospitality. I have a website, millennialhospitality.com. I'm also millennialhospitality.org, and, and which has pictures and more information. And the books can be purchased anywhere in the world through Amazon.com or at any bookstore. I tried, in my books, I'm not trying to prove that the extraterrestrials are real. For the first six months that I came across them, I, was, I, I, I thought I was nuts. I f refused to accept that I was looking at real flesh and blood creatures who had come here from some planet orbiting a distant star. And, and so it, even with them standing in front of me, it found, I found it hard to accept. It was, took me six months to get over the terror and the shock. and. And the, what, what I'm trying to describe in my books is how it felt. I'm trying to describe how that felt for two years to go out into the desert knowing that you weren't going to be alone or having the extraterrestrials come into my barracks at Indian Springs. It was a very tiny base. And, <clears throat> and the, the, uh, waking up at night with them there. Uh, after two years, I, I, I stopped questioning myself and made friends with a few of them. Each one of them are individuals, just like humans. Their skin is as white as a piece of paper. They have large blue eyes, and, they, and, and throughout most of their life, they stand as tall as we do. Uh, I describe all that in my books. They have men, women, and children. And you'd talk, most of the time when you were talking with them, you were, I was talking about very ordinary things, such as with the, if I was talking with the young mothers, they were interested in women's fashions, and I had uh, um, mail order catalogs for Montgomery Wards and Sears and so on. And many times, or if I was talking about their children, about how well, how healthy their children were. So they, they weren't. It was what I'm trying to capture in my books is the shock of it all. I'm also trying to capture the difference between talking with the extraterrestrials and com talking with my guard or you know, experiences with my guardian angels. So the books have more than just extraterrestrial things in them. When I was in Vietnam, my good friend Kenneth E. Baker from Laporte, Texas, willingly gave his life to keep me alive. 
And so in book three, there's a large section where I try to capture how that felt, how it was with Baker. It, it was a very religious experience for him to come and say that he was going to, that he knew in advance that he was going to die to keep me alive. So there, it's, there are a very emotional series of books. So Charles, um, I just want to ask you about the actual base. So yes. presumably this base was um, provided by U.S. black ops on, under kind of a veil the, of secrecy, the, is that? The, the, when, when you're on the public highway at Indian Springs, Nevada, which everyone can find in the maps, and f as my website shows, when you look north up the valley, th there's a group of mountains that are like 45, 50 miles up there. The base is dug in on those mountains. and. Right. The, the, and the Air Force runs that whole section of desert. It's the back door to Area 51. However, it is not itself. It's inside the Area 51 perimeter. But, but you, you, you know, you can see the, 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 the valley is very long, and as you see on the map, mm -hmm. of, very wide. And it's, it's at the northern end of that valley. They've been there for a very long time. The tall whites live much longer than we do. The tall whites live, uh, I estimate, 600 to 800 years. They live about 10 times longer than we do. But they don't age the way we do. When, when they get to be equivalent to a human, about 40, instead of showing the effects of age, they start growing again. So that throughout most of their life, they're the same height that I am, 5'11", but they're all individuals, so there's variation. And then, but then, when they as they get older, they they get very tall. Some I've seen them more than eight and a half and nine feet tall. But the very old ones get very fragile because their organs do not grow in the same proportion as their skeleton and their muscles. Eventually, they get so old that and so tall that their organs can no longer support their body, and they die of old age. Uh, um, th uh, this is not necessarily uh, the benefit you would think because their body doesn't heal as fast as we do. They're very frail and like if we fell down and broke a leg, we might be up and about in a month or so or six months, um, maybe in a bad case a year. But see, if they fell down and broke their leg, they would easily be five earth years before you could see much healing at all. Right. One morning when I was out uh, in the desert, after I'd become friends with a few of them, because they're all individuals, and so, you know, there were people that I, who trusted me and I trusted, and there were people that I'm still terrified of. <laughs> they're, right. they're generals. So you had to be very specific about which ones you were inter interacting with. But one time I scratched myself in the morning, and I was young and healthy in those days, and by the afternoon, I was healing up. It had already scabbed over, and I was no longer wearing a Band-Aid or anything. And a group of them came around, and they, had no, they knew that I had scratched myself in the morning. And seeing that I was already healed in the afternoon, they were shocked. One of the, one of the tall white lady visitors was asking their guard, are all humans like this? And their guard was saying, yes, they appear to be. And um, whereas for them, see, that would have been a month just healing up an ordinary scratch. Mm -hmm. Quite so, all right. so would you be, so you actually name two other races. Um, would you have any idea as to the numbers of tall whites that are at this base? Um, I don't have any precise numbers, but as I describe in book three, in 1966, when the tall white lady, whose CIA name was the, or whose name that she used for humans, was Pamela, when she was trying to pass her final exam for, for, um, for, to be in the technology transfer program, mm -hmm. her final exam required that she walk up to me with all of their instruments turned off and meet me on my terms. And of course, this was after I'd gotten over my fear of them. And, and to prove that she was meeting me on my terms, she had to turn her back to me and walk around me with her back to me to right. prove that she trusted me. And she was terrified of humans. She was terrified of me, as I describe in book three. On that night, I estimate there were between 200 and 500 tall white individuals, men, women, and children, watching her from the mountains to the east, along with several U.S. Air Force generals. 
and a couple of humans in business suits that I supposed were from the Department of Defense. And so the number of tall whites, uh, uh, while not in the millions, could easily be several thousand or you know, certainly several hundred. A deep spacecraft would tip the large deep spacecraft, they came in several sizes, would carry as many people as a, a cruise liner for the Mediterranean or for the Caribbean. And, and so it wouldn't be unusual for there to be two or three hundred of them get off a deep spacecraft, although the most I ever actually counted on a deep spacecraft was somewhere between 70 and 90. Okay. Now, you <coughs> mentioned technology transfer, and you said in your talk that the agreement was that we provided them with a base in exchange for some of their technology. That's correct. D and yeah. do you know what technology that they imparted to the... No, I don't. See, I was the weather observer. I was never, I, I, I wasn't part of any design program or I was not part of any reverse engineering program. I was not briefed before I went out there. I was not debriefed. The agreement was that anything I did, that everything I did would never be classified. Weather information is never classified. I understand that during the Korean War, for example, the Americans and the Red Chinese r routinely exchanged hourly weather reports all through the Korean War because it's never classified. All right. And and see see when I was out there, I had to everything I learned about them. I had to learn by either observing them or by talking with them. And they never came to teach me anything. They came for their purposes. A common one about half of the time was that the mothers would have children who liked to play. I'm the weather observer. I have pretty colored balloons. I release them with lights on at night. I track them. The children loved to come and play where I was. Uh, uh, here on Earth, we can see the stars at night. But I understand that on their home planet, it's bigger than the Earth, and the atmosphere is denser. Night is rare. And I, I understand that on their home planet, you ca they cannot see the stars at night. One of the things they loved to do was to walk around the Indian Springs Valley at night and just look at the stars. Well, they considered it to be an extremely beautiful place. Their home planet is apparently a warm desert-like planet without oceans but with only large lakes. And see, when, I, when, they, when they came to where I was, if there was no reason for them to talk with me, they wouldn't. They might just show up with the children, the children might just play, and they might go away and never say good, mor good evening, goodbye, we're going, anything. They, might, you know, they, 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 were, they were that way. They were far more quiet than, uh, say, what uh, you might have expected. They really, they really didn't feel like telling me anything. I mean, I was an enlisted man. I had only two stripes and later three. They knew very well that I was just an enlisted man. If they've ever forgot that, the American generals would be happy to prove it by having me clean a few latrines and show who was given the orders. And, and, see, and so they never came to discuss policy or anything. They came for their purposes. Now, as part of the technology exchange program, they needed some, they're naturally more afraid of us than we are of them. That when they come here, they have to over, learn to overcome their fear of us. And see, from their point of view, it was nice to have Charlie out there, the expendable human, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then see, they could practice talking with me and overcoming their fear of humans before they went off to talk to the quality folk, you know, to the people who mattered. Mm -hmm. According to my log books, the seven years before I was there, more than 41 American airmen were stationed out there as weather observers, each in turn, and every one of them had become compromised. Some of them were so terrified of the ranges, they would not go out to, make, to take the weather report. They would simply make them up from the barracks. There were piles of weather reports sent in from Indian Springs that were not worth the paper they were written on. One of the things I'm proud of is that I always went out and took the weather report, even though many nights I was, at, especially early on, I was absolutely terrified. All right. So, so Charles, how, it's obviously quite a large facility with, as you describe, mm -hmm. possibly thousands of beings there. How is this whole program kept secret from the American public and the world? I mean, would it not leak out into media and become a sensational story? How, how, how do they manage to keep this under wraps, such a huge secret? One time, 
it's, it's far easier than what you might think because people don't expect that, don't expect that. I wouldn't say there were thousands at the base all the time. The base was used like an airport and, and so, you know, when the deep space craft would come in, they would, they would be in port for two weeks and the, and the people would get off while the deep spacecraft was being repaired and refueled and refurbished. So the number at the base might vary from as little as the base personnel, perhaps 50, 60 people, to a much larger number, perhaps a thousand. But there was not a lot of people there. But keeping it secret was so easy. One time, my orders didn't, my orders were that nobody could ask me any questions. My own commander couldn't. He wasn't told. Only the highest ranking generals knew what was actually up the valley. One time I was trying to tell one of my friends who knew that something was out there. He was one of the maintenance men at Indian Springs. And a few of the maintenance men did know they were out there. But he was one, he was one, that, he was one that knew they were out there. He later died in Vietnam. And he looked at me like I was nuts. Another time I was trying to explain to one of my friends down at Nellis who, um, who, had been, who knew there was something unusual about the valley. I was trying to explain to him what they were. I, I was trying to explain to him what they were, that, there, that they were out there. And he thought that I was drunk. He thought that when I went out, and he, instead of actually listening to what I was saying, as a friend, he cautioned me, saying, remember, you have to be sober when you go out there, you know, just for safe driving. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and he, he, you know, he thought that instead of there being actual extraterrestrials out there, he thought that I'd just been out there having a beer party or something. So, you, you know, you, you didn't have to, to keep it a secret. You didn't have to do anything. Nobody believed me anyway. Yeah. All right, and Charles, and now we hear of people who um, do try and mm -hmm. um, break their official secrets act by telling people what they've seen in black programs. So, you know, is your life not under threat by what you're um, saying? The, the agreement they had with the tall whites, as I described in my books, was that nothing I did would ever be secret. I'm not whistleblowing or anything. When I wrote the books, all I was trying to do was to capture how emotional it was for me and pass it on to my children and my grandchildren. <clears throat> In the books, I'm not arguing any government policy. I'm not advocating any change in whatever the government thinks is appropriate. I'm not even claiming to know all about the program. I'm just trying to capture my experiences in those two, year exp in the, in those two years and the, the, the be with the tall whites and with the extraterrestrials that I called the Norwegians with 24 teeth, which I mentioned briefly in book three. And, and, and I'm not, you know, the reason that I wrote the books in novel form is I, to conceal the names and places, the names of real people, I conceal the names of people, I conceal the places, and, and, and distances and so on. So there actually isn't anything in the books that would cause, uh, the, would cause the government any problem. Mm -hmm. Because they're written in, predominantly because they're written in fictional form rather than you're stating it as fact. That's correct, right. yes. And I'm, and I'm not trying, and I don't, I don't name any real names. When I went out on the ranges, I took nothing out there except what the government told me to take out there. When I came off the ranges, I brought nothing off the ranges except my memories. I didn't bring any photographs. I did not bring any logbooks or anything. All that was belonged to the government. Why not join me, Richard D. Hall, live for an evening on board the Starship at the Oaken Gates Theatre in Telford, 11th of May, 2011. Or on the 23rd of June at Western Supermare's Grand Atlantic Hotel and on the 29th of September at the Academy Theatre Barnsley. In the show, I'll be addressing many of the areas I've covered over the past year, including false flag terrorism, UFOs, animal mutilation, the financial crisis and more. Learn what your government isn't telling you and what your media isn't allowed to tell you. Find venue and ticket details on the richplanet.net website. Further future venues to be arranged. I went out on the ranges. I took nothing out there except what the government told me to take out there. When I came off the ranges, I brought nothing off the ranges except my memories. I didn't bring any photographs. I did not bring any logbooks or anything. All that was belonged to the government. When I, when I left the ranges to go to Vietnam, I packed up only my personal belongings, my brogans, my shoes, 
and said my prayers and thanked God that I was still alive and headed off for Vietnam in May of 67. So are you okay to answer, for me to ask you, is this fictional or did this actually everything happen? In the, every, everything in the books is true and happened to me personally, including Hall Photon Theory, which is in the appendix of books three and books four. While I was out there, I got to see I, I, I got closer to, the, to, to their propulsion system than any human I know of. I got to see their scout craft, their deep space craft. Their, their technology requires, their scout craft and their deep space craft are built with a double hull. And in between those two hulls, there's, on the scout craft, there's like a thousand miles of fiber optic windings. And they're done in different coils. Mm -hmm. And then the propulsion, system, the propulsion system generates subatomic particles. There are more force fields generated by the subatomic particles than what Einstein knew about. Mm -hmm. Einstein and current physics, physicists think that there are only four force fields. But when you looked at their coils, as I show in my books, it's a simple matter to show that there have to be at least seven. Mm -hmm. there, I could believe there were 19, but I'm certain there are at least seven. Mm -hmm. And for example, uh, one of the coils, a set of coils, was an outer set that encompassed their scout craft, which was ellipsoidal, egg-shaped. And when they, power, when they were just sitting on the desert, powered down, mm -hmm. it looked like the fuselage of an airplane. Mm -hmm. When they powered up, it would fuzz over because that force field interacts with light. Now, what, I, I used to watch them when they were totally powered up, lift up off the desert in total silence with no sparks or anything until they were, say, only 20 or 30 feet above the sagebrush and then move a distance of like seven miles at an average speed of more than 8,000 miles an hour mm -hmm. and stop and then sit down. Mm -hmm. They could do it so fast that if you didn't, if you, they could do it so fast that your eye couldn't follow them. You know, your eye can't follow an object. So it would seem like they'd gone here and then blinked over there, but really they'd moved that fast. Mm -hmm. Well, if you tried to do anything like that with a rocket sled, you would liquefy steel. Mm -hmm. The force of acceleration when you were accelerating, when they were accelerating, was more than 15,000 times the force of gravity. Mm -hmm. But when they were fuzzed over in that force field, they could just sit there the way we are sitting here today. Yeah. So they could go and stop because it was moving the whole thing as a unit. Mm -hmm. And then when they sat down, we, they would turn down the force yeah. field and get off. The, the well, you need enough, you know, you can't do that with the no. four force fields, see? Right. And, and I, used to per, I used to, as a weather observer, you're always timing things and measuring distances and stuff. And they could do that in just the most ho-hum fashion. And the, um, the, the suits that they wore at night put off a fluorescent light and allowed them to levitate, but they had to balance themselves when they did so. The power pack was up behind the neck on the shoulders where you would think it would be. The children, of course, used to be very athletic, used to be very artistic about it. The older people might only rise up a mere nine inches and float and stuff. When I first saw them, I thought that I was dreaming, and that's why they called that area Dreamland. Dreamland is not Area 51. Area 51 is Groom Lake. Area 52 is Papoose Lake. Dreamland is another place. And that, when you went out there at first, I thought I was sleepwalking or dreaming, and then I thought I was nuts. Then I was, when I realized that I was looking at real things, uh, then I thought I was hallucinating. I refused to accept mm -hmm. that those were real that there were real people. It was a very, the first six months getting used to it was, an, was extremely emotional. In my books, if it seems like I'm afraid a lot of the time, that's because the first six months <laughs> I was afraid a yeah. lot of the time. <laughs> so Charles, have you heard of Bob Lazar? Yes, I've heard of Bob Lazar. And what are your thoughts on Bob Lazar? Well, speaking on camera, I only wish to speak about my own personal experiences. Right. And th or things in the public sector that I've you know seen, and so I I won't make a statement about Bob Lazar because I don't.
because because I'm, I, I only wish to talk about my personal experiences right. speaking on camera. Okay. okay. Now, in your talk, you mentioned a third race, um, which it were small gray aliens, which I think you said that you only saw at a distance and didn't really interact with. That, that, that's correct. But the, but there but those the the gray the small grays are the children of the adult grays. The, and and see see we see we're not see we have to change our way of thinking if you're going to interact with the aliens. The greys live roughly 150, 200 years, maybe as long as 300. I'm not sure. Well, that means childhood is longer for them. The tall whites, likewise. Well, see, see, they learn to trust their children more than we do. Their children can breathe the air, and their adults cannot. The gray adults need a breathing device, and so it's very seldom that you see the adult grays here on the earth. They're v terrifying. I never want to be around a gray. They're very arrogant. Uh, uh, however, the small grays have the, the flying, the saucer-shaped craft run by the small grays. Those are the children on board running the craft. See the, see the older children and the young teenagers who can still breathe our air. So, for example, the craft that crashed at Roswell, which was a gray craft, did not have adult grays on the craft. It had only older children on the craft or young teenagers. And at Roswell, there were three saucers. There was one that crashed on the 2nd of July, and then there were two that were out looking for it on the 7th of July, 1947. And, and see, when, when an American fighter took up, and they were in search formation, so they'd turned off the outer set of coils, because both the grays and the whites are using a similar approach of having fiber, double hulls and fiber optics in between those two hulls, and running subatomic particles in those fiber optics. I don't know which ones. And see, see when, the, when they turned off the outer set of coils, they have to drive it like a baby buggy because they can feel the forces of inertia. They can't actually begin high-speed maneuvers until they've fuzzed over, until they've powered up the other set of coils. Well, when an American F-84 shooting star with live ammunition took up pursuit and asked for permission to f begin the uh, live firing pass on the two gray saucers, they panicked. Those are children on board who are running the place. Those aren't battle-hardened warriors. They're just young teenagers. And the result, when, they bo when both craft wanted to power up, because the outer field would protect them from bullets, but powered down it will not. They're, they have no protection from bullets. The craft are very fragile. The, 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 it was equivalent to the two craft crashing into each other. Well, the one, that, the one on the north wandered into the to, off to the north and crashed at Corona. That's the Roswell saucer. Mm -hmm. The one on the south, it wobbled off to the plains of St. Augustine, but it didn't crash in the plains. It crashed on a mountain overlooking the plains. It wasn't found till roughly 1979, and everybody on board had lived for a while, but had never been found and died eventually. So the, the, the craft they were actually looking for was the craft that was on the plains of St. Augustine, New Mexico. The, 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 so, so you see there were three craft involved. The first debris field that the Army Air Force went out to look for was where the two craft, had, two search craft, had, a, had in effect crashed into each other by powering up those fields. Those fields extend for a very long way beyond the craft and will protect it from a, bullets, everything, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, from anything the, airplane, the fighter plane had. Well, see, that was the first debris field, and that's why the Army Air Force didn't find any of the other craft, because they were looking in the wrong place. So the Greys then, presumably there were some at this, the base that you were stationed at. No, the no. Greys have their own area, and that's not in my books. Right. The tall whites and the Greys are natural enemies, like dogs and cats. In Indian Springs, there are only whites. Right. Okay. So the Greys then... Have they been given bases sanctioned by U.S. black ops in the same way that the, the tall whites have? Uh, I don't know. Right. Okay. Right. I don't know. And do you know, I've done quite a bit of research into the, the abduction program, which is allegedly run by the Greys. Can you comment on that at all? Uh, no, I don't. I, I, I don't like 
I, I never want to be around the graves. I, I, I would be, see, if I were in Nevada, like if I, if I were up in Mount Charleston or Lee Canyon, and I came across some of my friends, the whites, mm -hmm. and since they live 10 times longer than I do, they're still, they've only aged three, four years versus my 40. Uh, see, I, I, w I, I, I wouldn't have any problem talking with my old friends, the tall whites, like the teacher, range for Harry, and so on. My, I would still observe the same rules. If I saw them, I would stop and stay where I was and let them approach me. I would never pursue. And, uh, but see, because see, they're, because they're friendly, like, they're, you know, they're like, they're very much like humans that way. And of course, the Norwegians with 24 teeth, gee, if you weren't a dentist, you couldn't tell the difference right. between them and us. It's very but, human like thing. Yeah, yeah. But the greys, I, I, I never want to see the greys. Right. I, 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 I didn't, I had to for a while, but which I um, will, um, won't go into detail, but there was a time in sixty in early sixty seven when I had to, but but uh, I never talked with them. I never made friends with them. Um, I it, it, I never want to see the grace again. Is it true that they can kind of telepathically almost re read your thoughts and get in your um, side your the, psyche or they're not telepathic. Right. What they are, like the tall whites, their electronics allow them to tell what you're thinking and to place thoughts in your mind. But if you meet one without the electronics, and if they don't speak English, you're strictly back to hand right. signals. Also, their hearing is at least as good as that of a dog, and their eyesight is at least as good as that of a cat, and their vocal cords allow them to make all those sounds. And so that means that they can stand like in a line, and I speak from direct experience, and they can be talking to themselves in their language, using um, uh, sounds too high for a human to hear, and they're well aware that's the case, and, and communicating, and, and it'll seem like they're telepathic, and really they're just talking to each other using a very high voice. Now their electronics allow them to put my thoughts in your mind, and it's adjustable in volume. It has a limited range. The longest that I ever saw the whites do it on me was at a mile and a quarter. And then it sounded like a radio going in and out, you know, losing the signal. There, there's, but if they're up close and there's several of them and they're all transmitting, it's like being in front of a speaker at a rock session. You know, you can't hear yourself think. It'll be so disruptive. So usually, usually, when they came, I would prefer, I preferred that only one of them transmit and the others receive only. But if they were adjusted properly, you could actually hear them talking to each other, as I describe in my books, depending entirely on how their electronics were set, because they could send only, receive only. Uh, in, on one occasion, when Pam, like when Pamela was panicking and talking with the teacher, and she was afraid of me before she had overcome her fears, she was, t she was telling the teacher what I had been thinking a couple days before, and I estimate that she must have been receiving my thoughts at a distance of five miles. But, uh, but on that, uh, so they can receive only, and so you're not always sure when they're talking to so you. So do you know how this works, Charles? Is it done through the, the pineal gland, or the third eye, as they call it? How, how, do you know how it interfaces with the um, mind? The, as I describe in my books, they greatly preferred to have a clear shot at your temple. You know, either one, either temple would do. But if you were if you were facing them directly, mm -hmm. it would still work. But if they had their choice, they would prefer to come around to the right, have somebody come around to the right, and read the thoughts off your temples, where they get a strong signal. However, because it's electronic, it's subject to electrical interference. So, for example, for them, it works best if you're just sitting quietly and not moving your feet or your hands, especially your feet. Because if you're, because remember how the brain is organized, and I'm not a medical doctor, you have so-called fissures on the brain, and on one side you do the thinking, and on the other side are the cells that control the psychomotors. And if you're sitting, if you're moving your feet or arms, then the cells that are running the psychomotors 
they're putting out signals too and interfering with everything. So it worked best if you could just sit there quietly and let them read your mind. If you were sick, if you were tired, if you were terrified, it did not work at all because the human mind can think several different ways. Once you panic, the blood flow and the way you think changes the way it works. So, so, you, so there, so, or if you're really tired, it'll change the way. So, it works best if you're well rested and there, and they can just come in quietly, and just read and read your thoughts that way. So, can they also almost anesthetize you and put you out, as would happen they in can a typical abduction? They, they can easily electronically hypnotize you. Right. It's no surprise, virtually every radar engineer for the U.S. Navy that I've ever talked to has a, a similar story about being up on the radar mast, having the radar mast broadcast, and having the radar waves hypnotize him, you know? Mm -hmm. One guy was told how he was up on the mast of a destroyer and the, one of the antenna from the carrier Enterprise 50 miles away broadcast and he was in the beam and it took him two hours to get him off the, get it hypnotized him electronically, kind of locked him up. And so, see, they could do that. They could, they could hypnotize you and unhypnotize you. However, if you understood what was happening, you could break out. Right. Many people who are magicians or who are hypnotists, the most common reason, I'm told, for a hypnotist to be um, sued is because he'll have a subject say and tell him to act like a chicken and mm -hmm. then have everybody laugh and then unhypnotize and tell him to forget it and then unhypnotize him and then the guy will be able to break through that and remember the trick is to go to, for the guy who wants to remember that to go to a very warm place a comfortable place and lay down and just let his mind wander and let the brain reconnect the memories. And the first guy that did that that, I, that I'm told of, that I've read about, was back in 1925 in Germany. And I describe that in my books as well, how you, how there were, and that's what missing time is, because, you know, as I describe in my books, they could come, and, and if they wanted to bring a group of new people around and show them a human, they didn't have to just walk up to you, see? They could wait until you were, like, like till I'd finished my weather report, my balloon release, and then hypnotize you and then walk out with the people and do their thing while you're standing there hypnotized. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, you know, send, and then on hypnot, then send everybody else away, unhypnotize you, and you'd never know what happened. Mm -hmm. It's just that you're, it's just that for some reason you couldn't remember what you'd been doing for 20 minutes. I mean, minutes, this, see? this presumably is, ex see? this presumably is exactly how they can perform an abduction. Which is, yeah. you know, many yeah. other researchers. Yeah, have, in in, uh, in my books, I describe how the teacher who had a little girl, and sh she, her little girl didn't have any other little girl playmates. She had boys for playmates, but she liked to take the little girl, the teacher's little girl, to play with a human little girl, who lived in Indian Springs. Well, to just play, so the children could play, a perfectly harmless thing. Well, of course, the little girl who lived in Indian Springs was never alone. Her mother was with her. Her father worked nights up at Camp Mercury. And so what the teacher would do is just come in and hypnotize the mother, like when the mother was washing dishes by hand. She would come in and hypnotize her and have her mother just standing there for like two hours. And then she would take the human little girl and the... Uh, and, and her little girl out back and they would play in the swings like kids and have fun and then she'd bring the little human little girl back in totally unharmed it was just her and, and put her to sleep and say don't worry your mother will wake up here in a minute go back and unhypnotize the mother and then you know they would all go away and the mother would think that she had just gone to the dish sink and, and, and washed dishes and that her mind had kind of fuzzed over and maybe she daydreamed or been singing, and and then you know, and, and then now happy would go and see a check on her daughter. See, and 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 so that, uh, there were so you know we we all we only hear about the abductions that um, or, uh, and I'm not an uh, I, I want to point out that there's other aspects of the abduction of of abductions that people never consider, and it's those kinds of like the one I've described where really the little girl wasn't being abducted for anything weird. It was because the teacher wanted her little girl to be able to play with the human little girl, for just yeah. for the same reason we take our kids to the park to play. Okay. And so this, this electronic device, as you describe it, that presumably that's some kind of psychotronic thing which is added to their biology that interfaces with um, them. It, it's strictly done with microwaves. They right. had, 
these little white instruments and If you encounter one again today, would you be would you be really scared or would you? No, I wouldn't be frightened. They're more frightened of us than we are of them. That's why they use a thing like a. It's like a. What? It's like a something like that, and they point it at you, and you're going docile. It's just like that. It's something like that. They point it at you, and you goes docile. It's strictly done with microwaves. They right. had these little white instruments, and I, I estimated that if we were better at electronics, that many of the things they were doing, we could do in less than 100 years, maybe, maybe even 20 years, because they were simply better with electronics, and they paid more careful attention to electronics for many things, you see. The, the, for example, their scout craft. Their scout craft was built entirely with parts given them by the U.S. Air Force, and then they assembled them. And, 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 and it, it, you know, when, when, I, when you went on their scout craft, it, 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 the first time I went on the scout craft or saw into the scout craft, it was really a shock because, like, what you saw there were the mold markings from American manufacturers. Like, they liked, for example, the tall whites, they're more frail than we are. They like to sleep in hammocks, which they find comfortable. So the U.S. Air Force just went and got a whole bunch of hammocks from cargo masters, cargo hammocks, from the Herky Bird, you know, off the shelf and said, here, how many of these do you want? They come in all different sizes, see? And, and when you looked on their scout craft, the, instead of having bunks where they would lay, they had places for hammocks. And then, you know, the, they needed a refrigerator. The, they had a microwave oven, but they didn't want the mechanical door on the microwave oven, so they'd taken off the mechanical, the door had been taken off, and instead an extension had been put on in the front of the microwave. And then they'd put more fiber optic windings, very carefully made, around there to generate another force field so that when you ran the microwaves, the microwaves didn't come out into the room. They would hit that force field and reflect, you see? Right. Well, there were, when you looked at it, there was just, you know, if you knew which par subatomic particle they were generating, you could have microwave almost like that yourself. Right. And it was all done with American-made parts. It's just that the, they did it, the American, they didn't, the, the, how they did it wasn't necessarily shared with the U.S. Air Force. Right. So the ETs were kind of specifying small components that they wanted manufacturers, and they yeah. were actually assembling yeah. them. In when, when their deep spacecraft came in, as I describe in book three, it came in with me, the one that came in with meteor damage. It was just barely holding together. They had the, the way they had designed it, it was about the size of a cruise ship, and it had a, the standard double hull with the miles of fiber optic windings in between the hulls. Then it had, and af after that hull, then it had another hull, and in between those two hulls were storage compartments for mm -hmm. food and stuff. And then inside that were where the living quarters were. And when you looked through the windows, it looked like the, the deck of a cruise ship. There were just decks and stuff, and it had the pilot places up, the place for the pilot and the co-pilot in the front, about two-thirds of the way up. It had the, uh, the, the um, engines in the back, so there were no windows in the back. It did not have windows on top or windows below. The meteor had come through in that storage area. Mm -hmm. If it had come through just a few feet further into the coils, it, it, it had killed them all. Or if it had come further in in the living area, but they had been able, but it had come through from the top and blasted a hole more or less ten feet wide, all the way from the top diagonally down through the bottom. Mm -hmm. and, <coughs> and when they when they brought that into Indian Springs Valley, <coughs> and the, 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 um, they had the land, there was no way you could have repaired it in space or out in the moon or anywhere, you had to actually get into a place like the Earth where you could take it into a hangar with air pressure and take it apart and put it back together right. again. Just, and just then they asked the Air Force for replacement parts, which included titanium and fiber optics and so on. The Air Force was happy to give them whatever they asked for, and then they went and repaired it in their hangar. And, and probably 99.9% .9 of the people who were manufacturing these parts wouldn't even realize it was for an ET craft. Didn't have the faintest idea. They right. would just go to a to any of the aircraft manufacturers and say, I would like four door units, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Or, or I would like or I would like um L l l like like to an RV manufacturer, when you went on the scout craft, it had a it had a latrine, it had a bathroom and a shower, 
exactly like we like like um, any of the RV manufacturers, like Airstream made. It had overhead compartments for storage things, and those were just straight off the shelf. I just want to quickly ask you about the the method of um, hypnotizing and controlling, as as you were mm -hmm. describing. Is this a device that they hold in their hand, or is it? Yes. Can you describe it, uh, Charles? Um, all I, it, it didn't. It was featureless, but it was like squarish, and it had a certain length, and. The power of the weapon had a, re there was a relationship between the power of the weapon and its length. So the older, the older ones would be, the older tall whites, they would typically be carrying weapons that were somewhat longer than the ones that the younger ones would be carrying, or, uh, and the children were never armed, but the adults were always armed. Once they got to be old enough, then they weren't armed anymore. But it was rare to see a tall white much taller than eight and a half feet walking by themselves, because by then they were starting to get kind of fragile. Right. So usually when you saw a tall white that old, there was almost always a younger person walking next to them to study them. Although it wouldn't be unusual to see a, two of them standing alone like guard duty, because mm -hmm. they were so tall they could see. Now their eyes, when they were children, their eyes were the, worked the same as ours. Uh, and, and I love to paint by number, and the children love to come and see my paintings. Uh, art aficionados have nothing to fear from my paintings, because <laughs> <laughs> the Van Gogh's record is safe. I'm not much of an artist. But, but, they, um, this, but see, as they, get, uh, when they, as, they, as they get older, their eyes become more sensitive. They, they get to see a little bit more into the ultraviolet and a little bit more into the infrared. This is not unusual. Many humans who are, th who are so supposedly colorblind are not defective at all. Many of them just have their genes adjust. Many of them, their genes simply allow them to see somewhat more into the infrared than ordinary people at the expense of visible light. Or at one of the rarest kinds of colorblindness in humans was discovered here in Britain in World War II. It was a lady, a human lady, who's, who, who was able to see somewhat into the ultraviolet and somewhat into the infrared, and, 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 and they discovered that she was a person in, in photo reconnaissance. And the way they discovered it was that she could never be confused by camouflage netting, because she, she could always pick it out. Mm -hmm. in, in order to describe the, the number of colors that she could naturally see, it was estimated that you needed a color wheel with more than 5,000 colors. It, you, because, see, if she looked at the traffic light, it looked sli a slightly different color if it was in the summer or if it was in the winter. And, and, and see, humans have that quality. Well, the tall whites are the same way. Their eyes naturally see that. So it's not unusual that that's the case. And, and, and as they get older, th that range broadens. So when I was talking to the teacher, the lady who's interacted with humans as a teacher, as I describe in my books, see, her eyes had already become more sensitive than mine. So when she looked at my paint-by-color, my paint-by-number paintings, see, they looked different to her than they did to the children. That's why they wanted to take one of, as I describe in my books, one of my paint-by-number paintings and take it off somewhere, to I, and it was gone for several months before they returned it, to show it to children, uh, to tall white children, at other places. Because, because, it, 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 the, the way they're, because only the children could see it the way I saw it, you right. see? So what would you say to critics who might say, well, this guy believes everything that he's saying, but he's obviously been taken and been put under mind control, and he's had these, all of the information that you've just given to me, that that's all been programmed into you through some military mind, mind control, and you know that there aren't any ETs. What would you say to someone who tries to explain your story in those terms? Um, I understand if people don't believe my story. I didn't believe the. Uh, it took me six months to to re accept the existence of the tall whites when they were standing in front of me. But my response to your question is, if it, it, that wouldn't be possible, 
if the U.S. military were that good at mind control, then they would have already solved all sorts of world problems by simply doing it to the world leaders. <laughs> See, the, the mere fact that you can have, the mere fact that you have a large number of people in this earth mm -hmm. that, you know, the Russians, the Chinese, and so on, who think differently than what, say, uh, you know, uh, from, our, from what Western diplomats might think, shows that the U.S., that humans, the U.S. military, whatever, whatever it is, isn't any good at mind control, <laughs> or else it would have used it for more things than just putting, right. you know. And, and what about the theory that you've been allowed to talk because they're kind of testing the water, to, you know what I mean, putting you out there as a, to gauge public reaction to somebody giving this information so that, that the information's all true, or uh, do you think it's purely because you've told it as a fictional story that they're, they're okay with that? Um, um, I can only speculate. I note that the agreement that I had said that I could always tell anyone anything because nothing that I did was ever classified. I also note that the tall whites themselves that I spoke with were not in favor of keeping their existence secret. They thought that the U.S. military should just tell the world that they really? were here and they were friendly, right. and 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 um, uh, 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 they themselves weren't in favor of all the secrecy. However, they were happy to do to make that agreement with the U.S. military. Right. And, and lastly, from the point of view of the U.S. military. Uh, 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 you know, the focus of my books is not military policy or government mm -hmm. policy. The focus of my books is my own personal ex emotional experiences. And I can only speculate, as ev you know, as other people, regarding, you know, what the military motive might be. I'm, I'm happy that, um, uh, um, uh, I'm happy to, to tell my story. I, it wouldn't surprise me if the military wasn't, or if the U.S. government or the Western nations weren't um, trying to slowly break the news to the to the people of the world. Mm -hmm. But that's not my that's that's not what I'm about. What I'm about is trying to explain to my children and grandchildren the emotions that I felt. I'll give you one. When my friend Kenneth E. Baker came to me and said that he he was willingly going to die to keep me alive. What I'm trying to explain in the books, I'm a very religious person. I'm Roman Catholic, my wife and I. And and I'm and we're a very religious person and he was a better man than me. I would have willingly died in Vietnam to keep him alive. And and I'm try in the books, for example, I'm trying to explain the emotion of how that felt. And I was trying to say to Ken, No, you know, you're the you're the one that needs to go home and he was saying and he was, he was like a brother. He was saying, no, um, God didn't give me the power, to, me, Charlie, the power to decide. God gave him the power to decide, and he called for his own name, and that he would die for me. And I'm trying to explain how emotional that was. And then later, when he died in a, in a communist attack in, uh, um, in 19, the early spring of in the Tet Offensive in 1968, how emotional that was. I went around for a week. I, didn't I, was, I was so upset. I didn't care if I lived or died in Vietnam for a week. And then I sat down one day, and I decided I was praying. And I decided that I had to be the person that he died to keep alive, the person with a sense of humor and so on. Otherwise, his sacrifice wouldn't mean anything. And see, it's those emotions I'm trying to put into the book. I, I really am not focused on, or I really don't care. I, I'm not trying to change anything the government has decided or whatever it might be about. All right, and Charles, well, on that very emotional note, um, yeah. I'd like to thank you for coming to England and sharing all of this with, with you know, people in England, you know, it's a, it's absolutely phenomenal story and oh, okay. we're really looking forward to you speaking this afternoon because you're speaking again this afternoon, aren't you? Yes, I yeah? am. Okay, mm -hmm. so good luck with that and again, thank you for you uh, and, and, and your wife for, for doing this interview. Thank and you. Thank you so much for having me on your show. It's a great honor for me and I, w and I wish only the best for the, for the people of England. Okay, okay. thanks Charles. Okay.